Well, today we're going to be talking about what uh, a lot of the old pastors that we grew up with might say. We're talking about sin, sin, sin. And church discipline and how to confront it. And this is a tough one today. It is. But uh, we're just going to see what the Bible has to say about it. So he's Chris. I'm Jeff. And we're the Bible Guys. So for our listeners or our viewers who watch uh, the videos, uh, we finally have Jeff Forster back, who's been Yay! gone for two weeks. <sighs> yeah. The crowd goes wild. In your mind. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah it's good you're, to be you're back. You're picturing everybody at their, oh. at their homes going, yes! Just, yay! Yes! Clapping their hands. Yep, yeah. yep. So, uh, so Jeff was gone uh, for a I couple weeks. I love you, my people. I missed you. Yes, yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we missed having you. But we had a great time with Dave Wilson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then Kyle uh, Dobbenmeyer. Yeah. Uh, just really fun to be with those guys. Uh, but you've been gone. And so please, uh, it, actually, it's part of our segment today. The, oh, se- the yeah. segment is, tell us about a couple of your favorite moments from your time away. And explain to people where you were. Yeah, so um, I'm on the board, uh, chairman of the board of the Timothy Initiative, which is one of the premier church planting movements around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now we have about 120,000 people uh, being trained, 160,000 people being trained in church planting around the world. So uh, that takes a lot of resources. We're able to start churches for about $400 per church. That translates into 20 new believers and orphans and widows being cared for. Uh, within 12 months of the church starting. So it's pretty amazing uh, ministry. And you can imagine even at $400 per church, it's very substantial. Last year, we planted over 40,000 churches. So um, this coming year, we need to raise like $30 million to keep the thing going. And so we had two big events, one down in Clearwater, Florida, and one in Huntington Beach, where some of our, our donors and our ministry partners came together. And just in those two events, we raised uh, just just at $12 million. So that's, that's pretty awesome. cool. Yeah, I got the report yesterday. And so it's really incredible. It's amazing when uh, people with resources are able to team up with people with, um, you know, organizations and, and teams that are, uh, you know, fulfilling their passion. And so uh, that's what happened there. So uh, and Bonnie and I were in Clearwater together and then in Huntington Beach together. Cause I took my wife with me. That was a lot of fun. If anybody's listening and they feel compelled for any reason to give a donation to TTI, what is the website? Uh, TTIonline.org. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and they can find out all about it. And not only do we plant churches around the world, yeah. but we also are uh, focusing on the most unreached people groups. That, that's right. Just In uh, the world. So there's unreached people groups would mean that less than 2% of the entire population would be Bible-based Christians. Yeah, that, that's what that means. And so uh, as far as all the missions money that gets spent in the wor- around the world, 3% of the missionaries go to the unreached people groups, and only 1% of the missions money goes to uh, unreached people groups. So that's what we focus on completely and totally. Places where they're in 2,000 years, Christianity's never made it to those villages in mm-hmm. the mountains or you know in the jungle or whatever, and that, that's where we're going. So that's it's awesome. pretty incredible. So um, my wife and I, we had a nice time uh, together. We met a lot of fun people. But we did get to at a couple different time slots get out and you know Clearwater Beach is so amazing. Oh, it's sure. like you know powdered sugar sand and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And I had the most amazing tacos in uh, Huntington Beach. So yeah, it was a good time. That's and a great. Nice time. Any any one specific moment that's fun that stands out, or was it pretty much all business? Or it was all business. Uh, yeah. It was morning till night for me. Um, just you know, there's so many people to connect with and yeah, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, yeah, it was all business. It's fun business, but it's all business. Yeah. You know, the, the places we were at were beautiful and, you know. Sure, sure, sure. I'm pretty sure people who live in Clearwater, Florida, and in Huntington Beach, um, I'm pretty sure when they get to heaven, they're going to go, yeah, this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us are going to go, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> but, all, the, all the Detroiters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're going to be like, wow, look at this place. And the people from Clearwater are like, man, it's all right. This is great. <laughs> it's so funny. So yeah. my daughter, you know, moved down just just uh, south of Clearwater yeah. and, and just south uh, uh, east of Clearwater Beach. And so she's probably 20 to 25 minutes oh, yeah, yeah. away from Clearwater Beach. Wow. So, uh, yeah, she's, you know, right there on the coast in St. Petersburg, so, um, so yeah, it'll give us a really good excuse to go down there and spend some time down there. Absolutely. That, that's uh, going to go suffer for Jesus in, in the <laughs> sunshine. For Jesus. I, I bet the Lord calls you to go visit like in January or February yes. or March. Yes, that's you know, what God... When it's miserable in Michigan. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. that's how God works. Mm-hmm. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, we're going to ask that you, if you would, uh, try to uh, interact with us on YouTube. 
Uh, you can either comment or subscribe or like or do all those things, yeah. but also leave comments Yeah, yeah. and uh, respond back to us. If you ever have a question or a, or a suggestion, we would absolutely love to hear from you uh, and just interact with our listeners. If you're watching on YouTube, um, subscribe. Please, 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 please subscribe. Uh, once we get past a certain number, we get a lot more control on the, um, on the, on the channel. So the way that you know whether you're subscribed is it'll either the button will say subscribe or subscribed, right? Oh. If it says subscribe, that means you're not yet subscribed. So click that button, and then we get credit for the fact that you subscribed. So, so make sure you do shoot that. for the D. Yes, subscribed. <laughs> that's what you, that's what that's you want to see there. If it's not there, click that button. That's all you have to do. That's great. Yeah. So today we're actually picking back up since we uh, took a break with Dave, of course, and then Kyle and I continued on. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. First Corinthians. We're picking back up in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Yeah, so we're going to read 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13, and so that's the whole chapter. And this is one of the main reasons why Paul is writing this letter. And they're kind of in trouble, right, at this point. So here we go. Here's what it says. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in the Spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. You must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed, and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns." Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about the unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. Wow. Boom, boom, boom. He's okay, laying so, down the law. Yeah, let's just start right at the beginning because he kind of builds an argument from the, from the bottom up. And, and on this one, first he says, this guy is living in sin with his stepmother. In the original Greek, it's his father's wife. That's why it, it's translated as... As stepmother. Yeah. Right. So so let's just give uh, a 30,000 foot view. So Corinth was a city that Paul had been to, started a church yep. and wrote, you know, and then he then he left and now he's writing back and he has, uh, you know, recognized up to this point, as you remember last week, that it is a very difficult to uh, live righteously in this kind of city. Right. It was filled with all sorts of temptations. This would be, you know, like, I guess, like, close to the Las Vegas of our day, oh, yeah. if we were to have some sort of equivalent, yeah. right? And so for a Christian to uh, recognize that, you know, the, the culture around them and everything that they're used to, that they've grown up with, uh, is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. It was very difficult for them. Uh, yeah, there was tremendous sexual promiscuity. Yes. The temples, some of the temples in the region were built around temple prostitutes, was, right. was the whole way that you would come in and worship in some of those temples. And so this promiscuity was very common, mm. and so the, even the Christians were like kind of winking at it. Yeah. And this is what he's kind of coming after. Yeah, and, and, and then also the, the other context, uh, you know, because obviously we're focusing on this man in the church, right? <clears throat> uh, but, but you can read the effect that this man's influence has had. So, you know, it says that they were bragging. Yeah. And not only that, but it, it's also the influence that this man has had over them. And he says, no, 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 you, you need to, you know, get him out of your fellowship because it's affecting, uh, you know, the influence of other believers. Right. So. So, so let's be clear here. Yeah. Every church only has sinners in the church. Absolutely. Right. So the issue here is the flagrancy. Except, except for me and you. Well, well, I'm a sinner. Um, I, I. Really? Yeah, yeah. You I'll never told that. me that. Yeah. Um, Just kidding, everybody. We're both sinners. Go ahead. Yeah. 
<laughs> I didn't know where to go with that for yeah, a minute. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of got stuck. Um, yes. Um, so, <laughs> man, you really derailed me on my thought there. Yeah, so you, you were saying, let's be clear, every church is Oh, oh yeah, so every church has is full of sinners. Yeah. That, that, that's all that attends any church. That, that's all that's in the world. Every Romans 3 says everybody's a sinner. We all miss the mark. So the issue here isn't that there are sinners in the church. The right. issue is the flagrancy and the co-signing of the sin or the endorsing of the sin. Yeah, and, and, right? and in this case... Uh, tip the tipping the scale to actually promoting the sin. Right, right. They're bragging right. on this for some reason. Right. So while the church is full of sinners and all of us are sinners, we should never say, oh, it's okay, we're all sinners. We should all say, stop, repent, turn to God, right? Mm-hmm. You can do better tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, repentance, grace, you, you can do better tomorrow. You don't have to do this, right? Stop going in that direction because sin of every kind always leads to destruction. It always leads to death. Whether we're talking about physical death or we're talking about the death of our relationships, the death of our future, the death of all of our hopes and dreams, sin always destroys. And so we can't, as a body, as a group of Christians, we can't say, oh, I know that's just one of your weaknesses. It's okay because grace, 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 love, 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 love. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to yeah, judge. Yeah, there's a time for that, but not not the overall arching attitude to have. Yeah, not not with believers. In, in terms of excusing the sin. Right. Right. And Paul really makes this huge distinction between believers and non-believers here. Right. Right. Yeah. And which, by the way, we'll get to that yes. because that's that's a pretty huge. big deal at yeah. the end. Yeah. Uh, so, so as of right now, he is, uh, he is basically saying, uh, excommunicate this guy because his influence is destroying your church. And, and he says, I can, I can hardly believe the report right. about the sexual immorality, uh, something that even pagans don't do, and that you're actually bragging about this. Yeah. And so your boasting about this is terrible, he says in verse 6. Yeah. Oh. And, 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 and he's saying you should be mourning and in sorrow you should remove this man from your fellowship, right? Yeah. He said you're celebrating instead of mourning over sin. And I think sometimes we can get so obsessed about grace and mercy mm-hmm. that we, we celebrate our, our passivity towards sin. Mm-hmm. We celebrate our acceptance of sin. There's a real danger in that. I think that's what he's, he said. You should be ashamed of it. Yeah, and Paul Paul addresses sexual sin uh, uh, more than any other sin, I think. Yeah, and it's because uh, back then there were no rules in culture. Back then, it was very widely accepted. Uh, and by the way, very not too different than today. Oh, absolutely right. So today, yep. if you were to think about the just the idea that uh, that a, that a, that a uh, a couple shouldn't live together before marriage, or they should save sex before marriage. Uh, that idea people would call old-fashioned. It's certainly the idea that nobody wants to talk about. Because if you bring that up and say that, like, mm-hmm. for instance, from a stage or from a pulpit, yeah, yeah. people are like, I can't believe you're saying this. Just please move on because, you know, nobody that I know does that. Nobody that I know saves themselves. Nobody's a virgin when they get married. Uh, and yet, clearly, the Bible doesn't, you know, it's not uh, shy <laughs> about yeah. talking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sexual sin is something that uh, in our culture today I think is Probably no different than it was back then. Yeah. So um, for the young people that are listening today, um, it may seem like there's nobody, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, I'm an old guy now, but my wife and I, we're the only people we've ever been with, right? Mm-hmm. So I think you can save yourself for your partner. I think you mm-hmm. can choose to decide to to that. And that, that gets rid of a lot of baggage. I mean, it eliminates so many things. Neither one of us are comparing our spouse to somebody else or to some previous memory or anything like that. You don't have to worry about what kind of diseases get brought into the household. You don't have to be. You don't have to worry about any of those kinds of things. There's there's a purity there, a beauty there, of discovering these kinds of things together for the first time, right? And and there's a it's it's less complicated emotionally. Oh, It's absolutely. less complicated spiritually. Even mm-hmm. there's a soul to soul exchange yeah. when when that physical act happens. Right. Well, the Bible says that. The Bible says that two become one. Yeah. And he's talking about it's it's a mystical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Yeah. Um, Paul which unpacks people, that big idea. Which people don't think of sex that way. Right, right. Yeah. And so you think of all the problems in our society because of an inappropriate view of sex and sexuality, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, set aside, um, you know, the uh, uh, rape and incest and, and those kinds of things. The majority, 90 something percent of abortions come because people are having sex, most of them. Uh, outside of marriage, right? So it's we're willing to end a end a life because we we value my right to have sex whenever I want to with whoever I want to so much, right? There's so many things. There's this huge trickle down 
uh, effect in so many areas um, because we've decided that we worship sex more than anything else. And even here in this church, that's what was happening. These people are like, yay, woo, the, well, look how grace-filled we are because he's able to do whatever he wants to and he can still be a part of our church. And Paul said, listen, it's going to ruin his life. Not only that, to move on a little bit, he says, it's going to ruin the church because, it, and he, 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 he um, likens this kind of sin to leaven in dough. You know, it only takes just which a tiny what, bit of leaven. Which is what Jesus did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just a tiny bit of leaven causes the whole, the whole ball of dough to rise into a loaf of bread. Otherwise, it's going to be a cracker mm-hmm. is what it'll be instead. And so he says, man, get rid of it because it's going to ruin the whole loaf. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's great when uh, the apostles and the disciples uh, liken back to Jesus' teaching. And in this case, you know, this is clearly yeah. Jesus' example in talking about the leaven of the Pharisees. Yeah. And just the sin that kind of creeps in. And by the way, that's a pretty fair comparison because that's sin creeping into the church. Yep, yep. Which is what Jesus referred to. And it, and it affects the whole thing. Have you made bread during during COVID? Did you guys make bread? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, just about everybody tried bread. There were bread recipes all over social media and stuff during the you know during the lockdowns and stuff like that. And so a lot of people maybe previously wouldn't have really understood the importance of yeast in in bread, but. Uh, it now a lot of people do that. It's just a tiny bit causes that dough to rise. And Jesus said a little leaven leavens the whole lump, mm-hmm. a little bit of yeast, you know, uh, does the whole lump. And so he says, let's be really careful. Now, this is also a picture, quite honestly, uh, leaven or yeast always represents sin. And so this is why at communion time, we always have unleavened bread. It's always a cracker, right. not a piece of, uh, you know, a slice of wonder bread. And the reason is um, at the, at the original Passover, uh, he said, don't take time to rise the bread. Instead, just to have unleavened bread. And so they, that's what they would eat. And that's what Jesus ate when he had the Passover supper at the Last Supper. And so right. that's what we do now. So when Jesus is talking about this is my this bread is my body, which is broken for you, he's saying, literally, um, it's, my, it's unsinful. It's not tainted by any yeast or leaven. Right. Not that yeast and leaven are sinful. It's a picture. It's the picture, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that's why we use it, because it's the best symbol. Right. And that's why he references kind of the Passover idea right here yeah. when he's talking about it as well. And, and by the way, I, this is just me. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, necessarily wrong or sinful to use Wonder Bread, because uh, if you're at home, you know, I think God can forgive the symbolism if that's all you have right. and you want to take communion. Uh, but clearly the best symbol in the example, and clearly the way that Jesus did it was unleavened bread. Yeah, if, if you have Wonder Bread and um, and saltines in the in the cupboard, go grab saltines. Go grab saltines, right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's closer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. So, so then when you move on before, he says, I wrote to you before, and I told you not to. So Paul says, listen, you know, because this is 1 Corinthians for us, but Paul's already written another letter to them. Mm-hmm. And it may have been the first few chapters of First Corinthians. It may be a different part of Corinthians, or it might have been a totally different letter. But he's saying, listen, I've already dealt with this with you people. So he's kind of saying the reason why he's so aggressive in this one is because he tried to address these kinds of ideas, this kind of uh, mm-hmm. purity and that kind of stuff with them before, and they weren't. So now he's coming in pretty heavy-handed. Mm. Yeah, and so uh, let's get to that part at the back end of it where it says uh, in verse number 12, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but the scriptures say you must remove the evil person from among you. Right. So I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, he had just sort of prefaced that thought uh, but uh, before, because he says, I, I, I meant that you're not to associate. No, he, what did he say? Oh, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in these things. Yeah, right? otherwise you'd have to leave the world. Otherwise you'd have to leave the world <laughs> right. to avoid people like that. Right, That's right, so great. Right. And those two thoughts are certainly connected. So what, what he's really saying, and again, elsewhere in the scripture, Paul talks about this, that uh, he actually says, you can't expect those who are non-believers to act the way that you believe, right, right? right? Like they're not going to make their same choices. They're not going to have the same worldview. They're not going to, you know, uh, say the same things. They're not going to believe the way that you believe. So, so in order, you know, when, when we're called to not judge, because people love that verse, don't yeah, they? Don't judge. Don't judge me. And uh, people love it. They, they love saying that. And they apply it to everything, even things that really truly aren't even judging. Mm-hmm, They'll mm-hmm. say, don't judge me. And it's like, I'm not yeah. even judging you. Yeah, yeah. I, love, I love when people who haven't read the Bible quote it. 
<laughs> right, right, right. Because <laughs> right, the Bible is its own best commentary. Right. So the Bible explains what it means in the rest of the Bible. Right. So you can't just take one phrase out and all of a sudden make yeah. that the cornerstone of your entire life without being able to justify it in the rest of Scripture. I, I, so Scripture explains what it means when I, it says that. I think I mentioned this before, but I was watching an episode where two brothers, like on the TV, were, yeah. were having this loving conversation. And he was like, hey, man, I've noticed this in your life. And the, and the, and the brother goes, don't judge me. <laughs> And I was like, dude, that is the furthest thing from judging that <laughs> right. he is doing. Uh-uh. But it's just that culture thing where it's like, yeah. the Bible says don't judge. But Jesus said, by their fruits, you'll know them. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> right. 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 So so every person who's ever gone to try to, I don't know why we do this, but you ever go to and, and thump on a watermelon? Doom, doom, doom. Doom, doom. When you're trying to pick out a watermelon in the in the thing, or, I don't pick out watermelons. Or, you know, or when you go and you, you you try to figure out is this banana is it is it too green or is it yellow enough? Yeah. Or is it too brown now? Right. Um, you know, you grab an avocado in the thing and you yeah. squeeze it and go, is that right or not? I don't yeah. know. You know, I've done those things. Yeah, yeah. So that's what Jesus is saying is you can tell when fruit is ripe, fruit is ripe, and you can tell when it's not ripe or when it's spoiled. And so Jesus is saying in that case, then among Christians. We can tell what kind of fruit a person is putting off. That's not being judgmental. Right. Right. And I think that's really what the pushback is. Don't be so judgmental. Right. It's really about the attitude. But of course we're judging. Judging meaning I notice the fruit you're putting out. Yeah. And there's good fruit and bad fruit. Yeah. And so and so the the, the positive side of Paul's uh, thought in, in, uh, in commandment in this case is that uh, within the church, it's our responsibility to judge, but that word judge doesn't have to mean such, you know, the negative thing that we think in our lives. Right, right. So just, you know, referencing back to that TV show, uh, here, here's a guy sitting down with his brother in loving context, yeah. you know, trying to say, I'm concerned about your behavior. And, and that's what we're called to do. Yeah. So it, it's the opposite of, of what, how the brother responded. It's like, no, this is what God wants us to do for one another. Yeah. I God see this in to, you and I want to help. Right. God, yeah. God calls us to call out each other, yeah. which by the way, is one of the reasons why we invite people to get baptized. Right. We invite people to get baptized so that uh, there's there's an accountability factor. You're joining a church family, and you're announcing, "I've made this decision. I've crossed the line of faith." And the reason, you know, and part of the reason is accountability, so that other people can say, "Oh yeah, that's a believer." So I'm going to encourage. I'm going to pray for. I'm going to bear their burdens, but I'm also going to lovingly point out. Some things. And, and, and so I believe that, you know, when you take, like you said, own commentary, when you take uh, uh, Jesus's words, it's always in the context of love. Yeah. So uh, this concept of judging or engaging with people in difficult circumstances, this this uh, theme is going to repeat itself a couple more times yep. in uh, First Corinthians. So uh, let's wrap it up right there and yep. we'll pick back up again tomorrow in First Corinthians chapter six. We'll see you next time on The Bible Guys. 